All right. Well, I will say greetings all, and I'll echo the sentiment expressed by Morris and Morris <laughs> that I'm truly honored to be here, and uh, I'll jump right in. Uh, so imagine this. A U.S. president walks into the Oval Office and tells the mem members of his administration that he wants his face added to Mount Rushmore. This isn't the beginning of a joke. <laughs> it's not even the beginning of a bad joke. Uh, a fool's errand, perhaps, but also uh, an errant thought that was given at least some voice when President Trump brought it up when he first met with the governor of South Dakota and then again when he stood in front of a packed crowd in a small makeshift amphitheater in the Black Hills on the 4th of July this year and bellowed the following culture war problem. Our nation is witnessing a merciless campaign to wipe out our history, defame our heroes, erase our values, and indoctrinate our children. Now, I don't think I need to point out what numerous members of the Oglala Lakota Nation called Trump's mockery of the deeply historical pains and struggles of Native Americans, imbricated as they are with the heritage of, of colonizers. But I do have to say that mockery is a good foundation on which to build this talk. And sadly, so is Trumpism. Uh, this talk is about the Nib's so-called empire issue. Now, the Nib is a magazine for comic journalism, uh, editorial cartoons, and satirical nonfiction. Its empire issue was published in the spring of 2019 with a jarring cover uh, that features a photorealistic rendition of Mount Rushmore in grayscale set over a beautiful shade of red. Uh, in view are the familiar contours of the rock formation with four well-known facial expressions. There are the four presidents. And Chris, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. There's some, uh, I don't know if you noticed in the chat, we're only seeing like the top left corner of your PowerPoint. Oh, really? Not the entire Let's thing. see. It looks well, like we're seeing like a window. There we go, cool. How okay. about that? Does that work? Yeah, that's a lot better. It's, yeah, it's like in a, still in a box in the screen, but we're actually able to see the image now. So that's All right, can you, can you see it? You can start slideshow and then the images are bigger. Okay, how's that? No, no start slideshow. Oh, yeah. At the top from, from current slide, the little green arrow at the top, I think. In PowerPoint, because um, it, it's been started. Oh, weird. Okay, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how. Let me. That has not happened before. So one second. So you're still. How about? Let me try this one. I'm gonna start it from here. Gotta uh, love. Yeah. Gotta love technology, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. No, no worries. How, can you see that? <laughs> um, are we seeing that now? We're seeing. Can you see most, that? I feel like there's still a little bit getting chopped off, but but better than it was so for sure. Does this one? But it's show not that? in. But it's not in slideshow view. Yeah, that's that's strange. I mean, I can <laughs> hold the images <laughs> up. Um, I mean, it's in it's in screen sharing, and it's it's showing on my end that you're seeing the whole thing. So maybe reverse the modes. Let's see. I've never done that before. So maybe the problem is when you're sharing, you sharing not the PowerPoint, but your Google like um like stop the sharing and do the sharing again and make sure when you're giving the option, which option looks better because sometimes this happens with PowerPoint. Yeah, let me try this. So mm -hmm. I will uh how's that? Better. It's perfect now. Perfect now. How's that? Perfect. Good. Cool. It. Okay. So <laughs> there are the four presidents, and they're all Trump. <laughs> uh, this co so this cover is a caricature. Uh, it's a caricature of imperialism, of settler colonialism, of westward expansion, of cultural assimilation and reservation politics, of tribal westernism, of the failure in our democratic experiment. Uh, and this element of caricature is important because it cuts across the Nibs empire issue and it operates as a rhetorical counterforce to imperialistic discourses by redeploying the discursive makings of imperial imaginaries. Now the issue is replete with comics and editorial cartoons and comic images from a variety of historical times, cultural milieus and geographic locations, but it's US Americanism and the American Imperium that really looms the largest. Uh, and in particular, the issue looks at themes of monumentality, collective memory, and cultural dominion. And it does so by refiguring imperialism in terms of what Henry Giroux has recently characterized as a disimagination machine. For my part, the Nibs Empire issue offers something of a comic reimagination of imperialism with caricature as its motivating force. But let me back up 
uh, just a little bit and say that I should start by answering the question, what is a disimagination machine? So in Giroux's words, it's a system of images, institutions, discourses, and other modes of representation that undermine the capacity of individuals to bear witness to a different sense of remembering, agency, ethics, and collective resistance. This system is alive and well in ancient regimes, but it's also in 24-hour news outlets, social media, infotainment, museums, schools, state capitals, electoral colleges. <laughs> Put simply, an empire as the result of rhetorical machinery thrives on images and ideas that demand little in the way of imagination or imaginative thinking amongst those caught up in its contrived appeals. It constitutes what, uh, that which is taken for granted in existing power structures, in systems, in the system. And the rhetorical machinery of imperialistic systems flourishes by putting opposites together, in Kenneth Burke's words, uh, and introducing new values and attitudes within the confines of an old guard that over time and across contexts becomes as diffuse as it is diluted. And this is how contradictory ideals can be concealed within, say, founding principles and how their metaphorical extensions can become the makings of material conditions that make sense even in their apparent nonsense. So empire here becomes a Procrustean bed, stretching any and everything placed in it. Or in Burkean terms, an empire as a rhetorical phenomenon, as a disimagination machine, is casuistic stretching pushed to the end of its line. So the, the Nibs empire issue offers what I call a comic stretch of the imagination, which is to say it pokes fun at the machine-like qualities of empires as imagined or rather disimagined communities with caricature as the key mechanism for dismantling imperialistic imagery. And here's how. There's a caricature by Francis Gilbert Atwood which served as a cover of Life magazine in June 1898 and it crops up in the nib. Now the center of the image with Uncle Sam's, uh, I think it sort of speaks for itself or at least I'm going to let it in order to talk about the border. So the border of the image is filled out with imagery that reinforces a sense that to proclaim civis Americana sum or I am an American citizen, which actually is in, in part of the border, is akin to proclaiming hurrah for imperialism. So society, literature, drama, politics, they frame the comic image. Society being represented by Alice taking advice from the white rabbit, literature as a schoolboy with a laurel wreath practicing letters, politics as a a bratish child soliciting a baron of the US treasury drama is a cross between a king and a fool brandishing a sword in the streets. Simply imperialism here creeps into the most consequential and the most banal aspects of experience. And Atwood's caricature shows forth a comic imagination, not unlike actually Mark Twain's anti-imperialist essay to the person sitting in darkness, which makes all too much sense in these times, uh, in which he imagined love, justice, liberty, equality, temperance, mercy, as the refuse of a democracy with imperialistic wellsprings. And this, of course, is the hook and the horror to be gleaned from the visual humor. Empires are not extraordinary because of their incredible reach from totalitarian states to nowadays corporations and commercial logics and digital cultures. Empires are extraordinary because of what might be understood as their astonishing lack of imagination, their blind devotion to manifest destiny. As Henri Bergson puts it, a comic imagination comes from the very observation of rigidity in ways of seeing and being in the world. In Bergson's terms, empires are rigid territorializing regimes, and they are machine-like in their reinforcement of in and out groups, borders, boundaries, and more. And the comic is a byproduct of rigidity. So a caricaturist or editorial cartoonist or, or comics artist redraws the encrusted or Procrustean ideas of empire as their own laughable effects. So let's take another example, and this one of how literal comic monuments are used to establish the contents of each section in the empire issue. Like the one of Mount Trumpmore on the cover, they're photorealistic but phony. Uh, one shows, for instance, a World War II era uh, US American soldier on one knee. Now, for the sake of time, I won't go into a reading of, of every image and, and, and not this one too. Um, but suffice it to say that the irony is that the battered and dismembered soldier almost appears to be kneeling over his own grave and yet standing as a living monument to the arsenal of democracy. I'm gonna move on to another one really quickly here. It, it actually depicts the figures of Augustus uh, seated on his throne, wearing a laurel wreath, bedecked in a toga and gazing off into the distance. 
And I'll actually dwell on this one for a minute because what makes the image a mockery not of Imperial Rome per se, but rather of American empire is the figure that appears with Augustus. It's a miniature version of Abraham Lincoln as he is immortalized in the Lincoln Memorial. And so there he sits, the great emancipator on Augustus's lap, his mouth, the jaw of a ventriloquist dummy. It's a comic reimagination to be sure, and one that we could easily view as an iteration of the critique that Lincoln governed as if he was the leader of a constitutional dictatorship as Abraham Africanus I. But the more apt rhetorical judgment, I think, relates to the exploitation of Lincoln and his legacy for imperialistic ends. Another monument might make this case even better. It plays on social media megaliths. It hints at the cultural influence of likes and dislikes, propagandistic disinformation campaigns, filter bubbles, content regulation, and cancel cultures and more. And it does so with a comic image of Mark Zuckerberg, the infamous CEO of Facebook, standing in imperial garb with a ghostly look on his face and a sort of thousand yard stare in his eye, presiding over what one can only imagine to be a gladiatorial contest of sorts. So you saw it a moment ago, uh, and in a previous, it was in a previous slide, but with that ancient symbol of a thumbs down and its resonance with online human interaction and communication, Zuckerberg indicates the weight of his prerogatives in determining who does or who does not get preferential treatment on his platform. The emperor here becomes content manager. His handiwork is embedded in algorithmic judgments and machine learning. <laughs> and so content management here becomes imagination control. Now, all of these monuments are reminders of how the Nibs empire issue portrays the scope of imperialism as almost as unsettling as empire's historical traverse. There are also contact points between monumentality and rhetorical history. So I'm gonna provide yet another example. Uh, and it's a, a full page editorial cartoon of sorts by Anne Telnace, uh, and it's called The Busts of the Trumpian Empire. So at first glance, it's a, a comic image of politics and patronage. There are laurels aplenty, some made of dollar signs, and there's an air of pomp and circumstance with the outward show of Roman garb. Uh, upon closer inspection though, it's a picture of democracy and its monumental wreckage. The bust of President Trump's son has been decapitated. There are remnants of statuary scattered all around the other sculptures. The president's arms have also been cut off and so on and so on. The point is that Telnace's caricatures attempt to manage the mark of imperial histories. President Trump is a presidential usurper unto himself. He is Julius Caesar, a man bloated with the vision of himself as father of an American fatherland, an embodiment of corruption that gets political power. He's what some would call a fat tyrant, right? A caricature of a brave new dawn of American unfreedom which makes at least one important point to emerge from this comic abridgment of an imperial rise and fall relate directly to something deeply embedded in the comics tradition. And that is that caricature has long been used to ridicule empire by way of comicality. And yet in so many editorial cartoons and comic illustrations, empire can be seen as caricature. So caricature in other words, has the rhetorical capacity of being imperialistic. I mean, it's easy to see caricature for its potential to make fun of the imperialistic machinations of mice and men, but it's a lot harder to see caricature as endemic to some of those machinations. And that's the point made by the Nibs reintroduction of a comic archive in the context of seeing empire for the consequences that can follow from imperial motives. So what the empire issue seems to be suggesting then is that some of the most powerful empires, and by the way, democracies and republics, <laughs> fall not when they lose the allure of their exceptionalism, but rather when that allure becomes unexceptional, if not prosaic. Hence why comics artist Andy Warner and illustrator Ellen Crenshaw's feature, America in Decay, stands out so much for its pages upon pages look at the American Imperium as a sort of apocalypse deferred. So there are many more pages here than I'm showing. The American way of life here is revealed for its general infrastructural decline in political institutions as well as in material conditions for living. There are panels on extreme weather as a result of, black, of bad climate change policies, crumbling roadways, railways, buildings, power grids, uh, parodies of news reports and photojournalism about President Trump's childlike approach to leadership and his emphasis on you know, the spectacle of public policy without any substance to match the pitch. I mean, Trumpism permeates the pages as the aftermath of a bygone era left to degenerate in real time. And Americanism is thus a metaphor for being trapped in old ways of doing things, in outmoded ideas, in olden glories. 
So let me start to wrap up with this. In one of the culminating comics of the Empire issue, Marty Tubles, uh, an editorial cartoonist and member of the Oglala Lakota Nation, captured the tendency of Empire to privilege the unimaginative over the naturalistic or even the humane, and therefore to belie the comic allure of the human condition. So four panels recount the arrival of pilgrims with bad intentions, the invasive and exploitative principles of manifest destiny and the dire fallout from Father Greed, especially with regard to the mistreatment of native peoples. Tying together these panels is a personification of Unkamaki, or Unkamaka, sorry, Mother Earth, embracing an image of the world with open arms and an attendant notion about the sacred circle of life. What stands out is the resistance of the idea of any fatherland. Colonized people are portrayed as victims of colonizers with corrupted imaginations. And yet the great spirit is seen as something of a comic spirit, and as such, Marty Tubles' comic spirit represents the same spirit that locates sacredness in a rocky mountainside before any presidential faces are carved into it. And through the lens of indigeneity here, the joke is on the imperialists. And this is made even clearer by the comic imagery to which Marty Tubles' cartoonish rendition of American expansionism is juxtaposed. And you've already seen this image too. It's a full page of caricatures by Mark Kaufman, and it appears as something of a reckoning with the points made by Marty Tubles, with monumental caricatures that convey a way of bearing comic witness to history. The caricatures are cataloged under the heading The Royal We, and they deign to put on display what Kaufman calls the heroes of the new American century. But as they do, the caricatures reimagine the natural formation of what Arthur Schlesinger once dubbed the tension between experiment and destiny and Republican self-governance. For Kaufman, Destiny is proven to produce little more than the follies of free will and democracy as an antidote to tyranny and oppression has never looked more like a failed experiment. I mean, consider his monuments, the emperor of the cul-de-sac, a white man of suburbia uh, wearing an Ohio state t-shirt and grilling a hot dog, the Insta queen, a white woman with a selfie stick posing as a stooge for product placement, general blackface, Prince proud boy, little Lord Starbucks, the Duke of Diabetes, and then of course the kingpin of them all, Sir Troll 765238, <laughs> the president himself, Trump, lying naked on a pedestal, wielding his smartphone as the rhetorical weapon that it has become. With each monument, comicality is the right way to capture the wrong sides of imperial histories. Caricature consolidates its ridiculous sides. And the point is that caricature performs the kind of rhetorical stretch of the imagination that imperialisms tend to lack and the comic sense in which something stretched doesn't necessarily snap, but sometimes, oftentimes, snaps back. And so the back cover of the Nibs Empire, actually, Empire issue actually complements the monumental front cover of Trump devastating Mount Rushmore. And it does so with a declaration that power is always precarious and an image of Lady Justice blindfolded, her sword hanging in the balance. So the comic critique here, I think, is that imperial histories repeat themselves when they are not reimagined, especially by those who have a vested interest in their recurrence. Caricature in the Nibs Empire issue gives new face to the rhetorical force of imperialist appeals. Thanks.